Well, hello and welcome everybody uh, for this, uh, our first IHSS seminar of this semester. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to, to welcome uh, Sarah Dunstan, who I'll introduce in a moment, who will be speaking to us today, and to welcome all of you into the room for what have been proving to be some really interesting and constructive debates, and I look forward to continuing that tradition today. My name is uh, Dr. Simon Reed Henry, and I'm the director of the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences here at Queen Mary. Uh, if you've joined us from Eventbrite or from outside of the university, the IHSS is a new and interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary institute which works to bring together the fascinating work that we have going on across the eight schools of humanities and social sciences here at Queen Mary, uh, the 16 research centres and of course the wealth of uh, networks and um, research groups that go on in between those uh, formal affiliations and we're delighted that we can bring together and push forward this work in new and interesting and exciting ways and today will certainly be no exception to that. So without any further ado, let me introduce uh, Sarah Dunstan, who is our speaker today and who is an early career fellow here at Queen Mary, where she's recently joined us. Sarah has a PhD from the University of Sydney and was until recently a postdoctoral associate with the Leverhulme Women and the History of International uh, Thought Project at the University of Sussex. She's held fellowships at Columbia University, at New York, and at the Columbia Global Center in Paris. We're delighted to have her with us here today. Sarah's work focuses on issues of rights, race, and international order in the 20th century. She studies empires as structures of global interaction and foregrounds the role of black activists to examine how questions of race and nation intersect across national and imperial borders and to thereby unearth some of the ways in which black intellectuals have both constituted and reconfigured notions of Western civilization. Now, much of this work comes to fruition in Sarah's forthcoming book, Race, Rights and Reform, Black Activism Across the French Empire and the United States from World War I to the Cold War, which is forthcoming with Cambridge University Press in March of next year. Sarah has another book publication forthcoming next year too, as co-editor of the Anthology of Women's International Thought towards a new canon uh, coming out in early summer, also with Cambridge University Press. Her talk today, however, while drawing upon much of this wider work, stems from an as yet unpublished article coming out next year as well, busy year for Sarah, uh, this year coming up, with the Journal of History of Ideas, and it talks in particular to issues of place and race in the context of French empire. Sarah, it's a pleasure to welcome you formally to QM. We're delighted to have you uh, with us uh, and to the IHSS today, and we're all much looking forward to your talk. The talk is entitled The Capital of Race Capitals Towards a Connective Cartography of Black Internationalisms. And so without further ado, Sarah, I'll hand over to you. I believe you're going to speak for about half an hour and then there will be time for questions at the end. You can post your questions in the chat box and they will be filtered through myself as uh, chair of today's event. So I will be able to put those to uh, Sarah in the discussion afterwards. And I'm sure we're all much looking forward to to uh, having a really rich discussion on the basis of your paper. So Sarah, please. Thank you very much, Simon. It's lovely to be here and I'm, I'm really excited to get to present to this fantastic group of people. Um, I just can I just check that my slides are are working? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Wonderful. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. So, um, black internationalism, uh, as it is used by historians, uh, is a term that can encompass both the radical Pan-Africanism of British West Indian activist George Padmore, and the more conservative cosmopolitanism of the first African American Rhodes Scholar Alan Locke the imperial loyalties of the Senegalese politician Blaise Diagne, as well as the radical feminism of the Jamaican journalist Una Marson. In the context of the United States, blackness has long had a history of being defined in terms of the one drop rule. In third and fourth Republic France, one could become whiter via cultural assimilation. Across the Caribbean, class and race have historically mapped onto each other in complicated ways often manifesting in a kind of colorism. Gender has also played a crucial role in how racial identity was elaborated and imposed. 
Stuart Hall perhaps put it best when he described blackness not as, quote, the sign of an ineradicable genetic imprint, but as a signifier of difference, a difference which, being historical, is therefore always changing, always located, always articulated with other signifying elements, but which nevertheless continues persistently to register its disturbing effects. So with such slipperiness in mind, how should historians begin to understand differences within black communities? How should we define and refine the practice of writing African people into history without automatically positioning their experiences vis-a-vis -a, -vis a Eurocentric norm? Now, a great deal of ink has already been spilt reflecting upon these questions and the historically contingent nature of the category of race. And today, I want to make the case for thinking through historical iterations of black internationalism and pan-Africanism, two categories of anti-imperial and anti-racist politics and strategy that could be both mutually constitutive and highly exclusive in relation to space and place and specifically to the urban city sites that they emerged from. In his notebook of a return to my native country, Amy Césaire writes, and I say to myself, Bordeaux and Nantes and Liverpool and New York and San Francisco, not an inch of the world devoid of my fingerprint and my calcaneum in the spines of the skyscrapers and my filth in the glitter of glass. Now, this lengthy poem is perhaps the best known of the Martinican intellectual and politicians works. And I quote from it here because it points usefully, not to mention elegantly, to the key ideas that I want to broach in today's talk. The poem is intentionally a poem of the African diaspora, of the Black International. It is a meditation upon the socio-historical construction of Blackness that Césaire theorized and coined a phrase for, nequitude. It encapsulates two different yet intertwined optics. The first is the physical space of interaction, the influence of the physical and lived experience, the literal way in which certain Western cities, centers of empire, were built using black labor, often forced black labor. This brings into account histories of slavery, of migration, and of urban living. The second is the imagined value of these cities, the capital of these capitals, so to speak, that is as much the product of the disenfranchised as it is those in power, even if these relations are asymmetrical. So from Césaire, I'm prompted to wonder if it is possible to write a history of black internationalism that allows the tangible architecture of a city to merge with the ideological structures associated with and engendered by the city. I want to explore the possibilities of such a conceptual framing using case studies of significant urban locations in the 20th century history of contestations of blackness and African belonging. Today, I'm going to briefly, very briefly, examine the interwar sites of Harlem, Paris and London before turning to the cities of Algiers and Dakar in the post-World War II period of decolonization. Whilst much important scholarship already exists on the first three cities in these moments, they're not usually studied in connection with each other, nor in relation to the post-war sites of black internationalism. Much less work has been done on the role of place in the post-colonial imaginaries of black internationalism that arose from Algiers and Dakar in particular. And today I want to not only interrogate this question, but to seek to compare and connect these post-war iterations of black internationalism to those of interwar Harlem, Paris and London. In so doing, I make the case for grounding the intellectual history of black internationalism in urban realities, a methodological approach that I hope allows us to understand how a place on a map is also a place in history. So Harlem, Paris, London, Algiers and Dakar were sites of residence, crossroads where peoples of different cultures pushed up against each other and shared ideas. There were also locations in which notions of black group consciousness came to be physically and psychologically enacted in different ways, often through experiences of discrimination and segregation. Race had multiple and coexisting definitions in all of these locations that are significant to reconstructing the dynamics of black internationalisms. 
Now, it's important to note that this is not a process in which the ideas embedded in these Western cities of London, Paris and New York were carried to decolonizing capitals such as Dakar and Algiers and indigenized. To the contrary, the producers or actors of black internationalism that came to these Paris, London and New York sites were also of these cities and they were the ones who seeded the ideas. They shared these ideas and understandings with others. That they shared these ideas and understandings with other thinkers does not make those ideas European a priori. Nor were these actors operating within some hermetically sealed realm of race, but rather in a complex contested conversation with Western thought. They were and are co-authors of the Western world, of the cities that are taken to be inherently Western, as well as those that are not. Pertinent here is Paul Gilroy's call for us to seize characterizing black contributions to modernity as distinct from or an imitation of Western or white movements. So in geographical terms, it is also possible to turn Eurocentric frames on their head by considering that cities traditionally considered to be Western sites are part of an expanded Caribbean or an expanded Africa. Martinican thinker Edouard Grisson advanced a conceptual framework, Creolisation, for thinking through the genealogy and relationality of ideas that is useful here. In his Le Discours Antillais, he argued that due to the historical rupture of slavery, identity and cultural formation in the post-slavery Antilles is an ongoing process of entanglement and intermixing deeply rooted in the physical and psychological space of the Caribbean. Later, he extended this thinking to include rhizomatic thought, a principle uh, in which, quote, each and every identity is extending through a relationship with the other, end quote. For Glissant, this ultimately utopic process of becoming was centered in the Antilles. Brisson's notion nonetheless has possibilities that extend beyond that region. As the West Indian writer George Lamming put it, there is a Caribbean in Amsterdam, Paris, London, Birmingham, in New York, and other parts of North America. Being in one of those places was, for Lamming, to be an important part of the Caribbean as an external frontier. We can illustrate Lamming's point by paying more careful attention to the way that people have articulated and practiced understandings of the Caribbean in ways that go far beyond a geographical location in the Caribbean. So to extend this line of thinking, this process or this creolisation can also be understood as something that occurs when the colonized encounter the colonizers on their home ground, so to speak. Flipping the perspective allows us to understand the trajectories of non-Western thought, not in relation to ideas coming outwards from Europe, as in Dipish Chakrabarti's critique of Eurocentric historicism, first in the West and then elsewhere, but as circles of influence coming outwards from Africa or the Caribbean, and then ricocheting back to these sites in particular moments. So interwar Harlem, and uh, sorry, interwar New York, and specifically Harlem, as the first African-American Rhodes Scholar Alan Locke so famously declared was the Mecca of the new Negro and the Israel of the black man. Reaching from Manhattan's 96th Street up to 155th Street and framed roughly by Frederick Douglass Boulevard and Fifth Avenue, the neighborhood of Harlem had earned that moniker not just because it was home to many black people from the United States, the Caribbean and Africa itself, but because it was a vibrant and dynamic space in which versions of blackness were constantly being elaborated. In 1927, the Harlem Renaissance writer Wallace Thurman described Harlem as a cosmos within itself. Laymen, Thurman wrote, quote, indiscriminately lumped Harlem's people together as Negroes or niggers. But the reality was that in the veins of the American Negro flows the mixed bloods of the Africans from whom he originally stemmed, the American Indians, every white race under the sun. And in Harlem, this homegrown ethnic amalgam is associated and intermixing with Negroes from the Caribbean, from Africa, Asia and South America." End quote. Harlem's urban space 
played a particularly significant role in bringing these multiple peoples together and in circulating ideas around black internationalism more generally. Census data shows us that high demand for housing, Harlem had a population density of 336 people per acre, led to diverse peoples sharing living quarters. And we can see this in the emergence of black internationalist movements as different as Marcus and Amy Ashwood Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, W.E.B. Du Bois's Pan-African Congresses and Associations, and the African Blood Brotherhood, founded by Caribbean emigres, Cyril Briggs, Otto Huisford, Richard Moore, and African-American activist Grace Campbell. Sites such as Speaker's Corner at 135th Street and Lennox Avenue saw orators such as the West Indian socialist organizers A. Philip Randolph, Hubert Harrison, and, Universe, and the Universal Negro Improvement Association founders Marcus and Amy Ashwood Garvey holding forth on multiple topics, uh, including racial uplift, labor organization, phil philosophy, and psychology. Crowds entering and exiting the subway station there or browsing in nearby shops stopped to listen to these speakers. Many were mobilized to join organizations such as the African Blood Brotherhood on the basis of the ideas that they had heard in the street. Now, Paris had a similar cachet to New York in the interwar period. American civil rights activist Roger Baldwin called Paris the capital of men without a country and the headquarters of agitation where black, brown and yellow men can argue their case for freedom, end quote. Black internationalism in this context was constituted by the Pan-African Congresses held by W.E.B. Du Bois and Blaise Diagne on strictly black African lines, as well as in terms of anti-colonial solidarity across French colonial territories, which at various moments encompassed black African, Antillean, Indo-Chinese and Arabic identities. Gender played an important role in these constructions of blackness. Movements such as Du Bois's Pan-Africanism often staked their claims to equality in their identities as civilized men, whose intelligence and level of education spoke to their assimilation into the Western world. So too did the so-called trois pairs of the Paris-born political and cultural movement of Negritude, Léon Gontran de Masse, Léopold Sédar Senghor, and Aimé Césaire, construct their theories of racial identity in masculine terms. Such constructions ran at odds with the experiences of women of color occupying the same physical, if not ideological spaces. Indeed, at the 1919 Pan-African Congress held in Paris, one of the few women in attendance was the African-American nurse and activist Ad Addie Hunton. She criticized the delegates for ignoring black women's experiences and urged them to remember the importance of women in the world's reconstruction and regeneration. So too did thinkers such as the Martinican intellectual and activist Paul et Nadal believe that Antillean women in Paris stood at the vanguard for the fight for racial solidarity, whilst Antillean men were, quote, content with the certain easy success that was afforded by their sex and access to education. Paulette and her sister Jane were certainly key figures in the Parisian interwar black internationalism. For several years, they ran a Sunday salon at their home, 7 Rue Hébert, in the Parisian suburb of Clermont. Many artistic and creative luminaries from across the Antilles, Africa and the Americas came together at their salons to discuss Paris or world news, colonial and interracial problems, and the growing place of men and women of colour in French life, as well as every manifestation of racism. These salons were crucial to the formation of the Harlem Renaissance connections made by Damas, Senghor and Césaire in the mid-1930s. Moreover, the three men's thinking about race and national belonging, that is so famously known as Negritude, owed a huge intellectual depth to both the salons and the writing of the, Nals, of the Nadal sisters themselves, although the three men never acknowledged it. Instead, Césaire was retrospectively scathing about the feminine and domestic space of the salons, making a point of stating that he had never enjoyed attending a single one. The Nadal's cousin, Louis Achilles, also described the salons in terms of a feminine influence, a suburban domesticity that sat apart from a corporate circle or masculine club, 
Nevertheless, this female space ultimately produced one of the most important black internationalist journals of the interwar period, La Revue du Monde Noir. Now, interwar London was a very different place to Paris and certainly ascribed a different kind of ideological capital with intellectuals such as the British West Indian writer Eric Walrond describing it as the cradle of English liberty, justice and fair play. The place where British, the British West Indian realises for the first time that he is in fact West Indian rather than just British. Another West Indian student summed up this sentiment rather neatly when he said, I've often had occasion to remark that much of the nationalism in the West Indian Negro is born at Paddington, the train station at which I arrived when I first came to England. Driving through the streets of Paddington, the student experiences an England at odds with the bowler hats and brollies of the Trafalgar Square that newsreels had shown him. He notices that he speaks better English than many of the white Londoners he meets. And this prompts him to wonder if he has, quote, been falsely led to believe that his fellow Negroes in Africa have not progressed beyond the shanties and tribal dance displays that so often greet him at the cinema, end quote. But still, West Indian remained a group identity for organising purposes that was often clearly delineated from African. Um, somewhat differently, the African-American actor and activist Paul Robeson felt that London was the place that he came to consider that he was an African. Others, like the Sudanese Egyptian intellectual Dizem Ahmed Ali, extended the sense of an international African identity to encompass all of what he called the darker races. He wrote, black, brown and yellow races within and without empire have a singular international identity when it comes down to shared experiences in the metropole of derision, contempt and repression. Black group consciousness also intersected in London with myriad other political movements. In London, it was possible for the Jamaican novelist and radical Claude Mackay to write for the suffrage activist Sylvia Pankhurst's work as Dreadnought. He reported on the labour and racial struggles of the city's Docklands and championed the Irish struggle against the English. Mackay knew Pankhurst through friends of his from New York, the radical editors of the Liberator magazine, Max and Crystal Eastman. Alternatively, black women like the Jamaican journalist Una Marson chafed against the male-oriented nature of much of the race-based organising in interwar London and turned to feminist, if still racist, organisations such as the British Commonwealth League in order to fight for women's rights. So whilst historians have paid attention to the imagined capital of cities such as New York and London on an individual basis, they've yet to bring these studies together to map a new cartography of black internationalism in this period. By placing Paris and London side by side, we can see how the elaboration of a particular kind of English liberty sets London apart from the liberté of the Parisian landscape. There's a distinction between the notions of liberty extolled in the British and French contexts, and this becomes a key cleavage in elaborations of black internationalism at this moment, a difference which mapped onto linguistic differences as well. You can see a continuity, however, in some of the ways that gender dynamics operated to doubly exclude or marginalise black women. If New York is added to the mix alongside Paris and London, we can trace the crossings and connections that existed between these capitals, understanding the continuities as well as the differences that they generated. So from 1939 onwards, New York and Paris and London began to be conceptualised as part of a fuller black and African international landscape amongst activist imaginaries. So in 1930, the African-American poet Langston Hughes, in his poem, What is Africa to Me, could write, through some vast mist of race, there comes this song I do not understand, this song of atavistic land, of bitter yearnings lost without place. But by the 1950s, as African nations began to gain their independence from empire, African cities emerged from this amorphous, vast mist of race, Hughes described, to become tangible places in the international black imaginary, as they had always been in the lives of their inhabitants. So the features 
that Roger Baldwin uh, had ascribed to Paris meetings of intellectuals, of newspapers circulating, and ideological resonances of freedom and liberty were characteristic of post-colonial African cities such as Dakar and Algiers as they fought to elaborate blackness and Africanity in cityscapes physically shaped and politically haunted by colonialism. So we can see this in the case study of the city of Dakar in Senegal, which in 1966 hosted the Festival Mondial des Arts Negres, or the World Festival of Negro Arts. Held under the auspices of President Leopold Sédar Senghor, the festival brought together participants from 45 African, European, West Indian and North and South African countries. The festival was simultaneously praised as a celebration of blackness and criticised as far too elite and white, with too many lingering traces of French colonialism. When given the opportunity to vote in the French uh, Communauté referendum of 1958, Senegal had voted to remain, only taking independence when the fragmentation of the French Empire was certain. Leopold Sédar Senghor, one of the three so-called fathers of negritude that I spoke about earlier, um, was the new president of the Republic of Senegal, but he had genuinely believed in the potential for a Euro-African organisation of France that would allow African states to exist in federation with France. Nonetheless, Senghor and many of his colleagues within and outside of Senegal believed that the post-colonial independent uh, Dakar should now be recognised as a capital of black culture. They believed that the existing geographical design of Dakar's cityscape lent itself to an identity as a capital of the black world, as Paris was to the Western world. The programme for the festival of 1966 described Dakar as the natural location for black international meetings because it was, as a port city, at the crossroads of Europe, the Americas and Africa. This was true in another sense too. The city comprised a cross-section of black religious identities, Islamic, Catholic and Sarer. The 1966 festival and the city itself were to be, quote, an illustration of negatude a demonstration of the black man's capacity to contribute to universal civilization and to enter into the frame of modernity. Senghor and his government invested a very serious amount of the nascent nation's capital into cultural development. Somewhere between 25 to 30 percent of the national budget was allocated to the Ministry of Culture, and this was separate from additional funds invested in the city's infrastructure ahead of the festival. New developments included the renovation of the port and additions to Yoth Airport, the construction of the Daniel Serrano National Theatre, capable of seating 1,200 people, and the building of the Musée Dynamique for a commissioned exhibition, L'Art Negre, or Negro Art, Sources, Evolution and Expansion. In general, France, as well as the United States and the Soviet Union, had supplied a great degree of financial and technical support for the 1966 festival. The Soviet support was particularly unmissable as it came in the form of several large cruise liners docked in Dakar's port. These liners were used as hotel lodgings for festival attendees. Now, this left Senghor open to charges of allowing a kind of neo-colonialism. The South African poet, Kira Petsi um, Kogotsitsili, and apologies for <laughs> my butchering of his name, had argued that even the most beautiful poem Senghor can write about the validity of the existence of a black culture without attempting to make the social institutions in Senegal actually African, actually liberated from France, does not even improve the diet of a single undernourished black child anywhere in the world where black people are colonised by the Caucasians. Alongside the continued connections to Paris, in the Dakar Festival of Black Culture, these physical manifestations of neo-colonial and Cold War interests in Dakar's cityscape are indicative of the way that Black internationalism has always been implicated within particular political constellations, whether the imperial edifices of France and Britain or the struggles for hegemony of the US and the Soviet Union. The city of Algiers was a very different political and cultural space in imaginaries of Pan-Africanism and Black internationalism. Algeria, and particularly the Algerian Front de Libération Nationale, or the FLN, 
had drawn the world's attention in its decade-long struggle for independence from France. Algiers, the nation's capital, was at the forefront of this focus, not least because it was the political seat of power. Amilcar Cabral, a poet and political activist from Guinea-Bissau, described it as the Mecca of revolution. Palestinian Yasser Arafat characterized the city as the window through which we appear to the West. This was not just figurative posturing. The newly independent nation stood between the European and African continents, a literal gateway from North and South, uh, Europe and Black Africa, as well as the Arab world. And this revolutionary change was writ large on the physical landscape of the city. Colonial Algiers had been a segregated space, home to the largest French population outside of France, the Pieds Noirs. The urban space of the city reflected the colonial hierarchy with a European colonial centre clearly demarcated in relation to the primarily Muslim Kasbah. When the France de Libération Nationale emerged victorious and the Evian Accords were signed in 1962, the physical architecture of the city remained a clear reminder of the colonial past. Between 300 and 330,000 Pied Noir left, had left the city by 1962 and their homes were filled as the elite amongst Algerian families moved from the Kasbah into the European centre of the city. Their houses were in turn filled with the flow of people who had been displaced by the French military camps. In this process, the city population increased by two thirds by 1966. And it was the very literal achievement of the dream the Caribbean psychologist and activist Frantz Fanon had described in his 1963, The Wretched of the Earth, where he states, there is no colonized man who does not dream at least once a day of putting himself in the place of the colonist. Before his death in 1963, Fanon had dreamt of carrying Algeria to the four corners of Africa. And indeed, the corners of the African diaspora were certainly watching. From Harlem, the Caribbean activist Richard Moore wrote that the inhuman atrocities of the French colonialists against the Algerian people who were struggling valiantly for their independence aroused widespread sympathy and fraternal support among the people of Harlem. Now, this interest went both ways. When the FLN leader Ben Bella visited New York in October 1962 for a United Nations assembly, he observed to Martin Luther King Jr. that there was a direct relationship between the injustices of colonialism and the injustices of segregation. King agreed, writing that the battle of the Algerians against colonialism and the battle of the Negro against segregation is a common struggle. The language the two men used was heavily gendered, emphasizing a racial brotherhood uh, linked to African diaspora that left little room for the struggle of women wrestling with the intersecting dynamics of race and gender. Now, Martin Luther King never visited Algiers, but his contemporary Malcolm X did. Walking through the streets of the Kasbah, Malcolm X saw the conditions the Algerians had lived under while they were colonized the segregated setup of colonial Algiers cityscape alongside the stories of degradation and humiliation struck a chord with the radical activist, not least because those same conditions were all too evident to him in America in every black community. He had seen their like in Boston and in Flint, as well as in New York. The Algerians were Malcolm X's blood brothers, just as they were the blood brothers of every black man in America. Of course, Malcolm X was tied to the FLN by faith as well as racial sensibilities. He had adopted an Arabic name, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, with his conversion to the Islamic faith. Nevertheless, Algiers would prove a temporary home to the organization that Malcolm had inspired, the Black Panther Party, even if these African Americans did not necessarily share the Islamic religion. From 1968 through 1974, approximately 30 Black Panthers lived in a hilltop villa in Algiers. The Algerian government paid them monthly bursaries and gave them a storefront in the centre of the city for their meetings and activism. Elaine Moktefi, an American working for the Algerian National Press, recalled that she received invitations for Black Panther leader Eldridge Cleaver to meet with ambassadors of North Vietnam, China, and North Korea, as well as representations of the Palestinian Liberation Movement and the National Liberation Front of the South Vietnam. 
For Moktefi, the irony of the Black Panther radicalism existing within what she saw as an essentially conservative society was simply ignored by many of the radicals living there. She argued that for all the professions towards Black international solidarity and Pan-Africanism, Algiers was not without its anti-Black racism. So too was she struck by the confinement of women's behaviour within the Islamic community, a situation at odds with her own belief in gender equality. At the same time, Barbara Easley, another of the Black Panthers who lived for a time in Algeria, spoke glowingly about the opportunity Algeria provided to meet women from other liberation movements. Moreover, for African-American radicals who had seen Gilo Pontecorvo's 1966 historical film, The Battle of Algiers, the city was a political symbol of the struggle for freedom. When she visited Algiers in 1969, a young African-American student, Michelle Russell, wrote that we had seen the film Battle of Algiers in the States. Now, wandering the city, each street came upon us with the shock of a double exposure. Neon signs became the flames of bombed cafes. Women in veils became saboteurs. Taxi drivers, the incarnation from Harlem to Algiers of dedicated cadres careening around corners to unknown rendezvous. This sense of Algiers as a cityscape of revolutionary capital transcended an Algerian African-American access. The Algerian government also gave financial support and buildings to a number of black revolutionary movements, such as the Mozambique Liberation Front, the South African uh, ANC or African National Congress. Algiers was also the location of choice when the Organization of African Unity decided in September 1967 that there was an urgent need to hold a second Bandung conference to promote African cultures and international unity. As in Dakar, this, de this decision meant the rapid construction of a conference venue and accompanying luxury hotel that befitted the honor of being the Mecca of revolution. Funding for the project was international indeed, coming from Egyptian, Chinese and French sources in order to have the city ready in time for the July 1969 meeting, the first Pan-African Cultural Festival. More than 10,000 men and women from throughout the Black international landscape flocked to the city to discuss the role of Black culture in revolutionary movements. The boundaries between Black culture and African culture were, it should be noted, blurrily defined in this moment, often encompassing both Black and Arabic Africa and the multitude of national, ethnic and religious identities that fell under those umbrella terms. So today I've gestured to some of the ways that New York, Paris, London, Algiers and Dakar have been both repositories and producers of Black internationalism in ways that are deeply shaped by place, whether in the imagery of poetry such as Césaire's in the, or in the filmmaking of Pontecorvo or in the language of political and cultural debates and movements, these 20th century cityscapes became both symbolic vehicles for constructing visions of blackness and African belonging and mechanisms for their conscious and unconscious development. Connecting these cities as locations of and symbolic vehicles for constructing visions of blackness and African belonging gives us a way, I think, of mapping out the rich texture and character of black internationalism and pan-Africanism that illuminates the myriad workings of race as a historical category and as a lived experience. Thank you. Sarah, Sarah, thank you, thank you. Ever, so ever so much for what was a really, really fascinating, fascinating and, and an in-depth in discussion of, of, of a range of things. Thing. And I'm sure, I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions, questions. to follow up on follow particular up things and then in terms of some of the bigger, bigger, bigger issues, issues, both historiographically and also uh, empirically in relation to the cities, to the sites and the, the periods that you, that you traverse in the story. I mean, it's, it's wonderful the way that the sort of the nodes, uh, both in terms of individuals, but also in terms of the places that you pull together really changes the narrative structures in which we've we've written so many different historical accounts. I mean, my head's sort of buzzing with lots of different questions from, from, from a range of points of view. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll raise a couple of those in, in just a second, just to get us going, but I just wanted to set out as a reminder that all of you are able to use the Q&A. You can either do it anonymously or you can do it with your name and affiliation. 
Um, and when you post that in there, it will come through to me and then I can put the put the question to Sarah. Um, so I had just an initial question, if, if you will, and I'll, and I'll come back on some of the other points uh, actually specifically about gender, which I, which, I, which I really think is such a, the way you tell the story opens up so many useful perspectives on that whole uh, missing element of, of, of some of these histories that I want to come back to later on. But, but my first question was a bit more of a specific one, and it was, it was related to this idea about the sort of the, the 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 cultural hierarchy of some of these capitals and 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 what they are traditionally made to represent and and you know, we're talking about Algiers towards towards the end there and of course when I think of that I from my own work I kind of think of, of the role of of Cuba um, in 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 Algeria's struggles and particularly their relationship with Bembella prior to sixty five and and I'm thinking you know when you were telling the story about about the Black Panthers and the and the shop front and the, and the support that they were given you know in that context, that's a kind of global, in, in, you know, in, in developmental type terms, a global north, global south kind of kind of coming together. But I'm also thinking of, of what development scholars would call the sort of the south south connection here in relation to somewhere like Havana and its investments in 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 both the radicalism, but also in the cultural attributes of of the of the Algerian um, situation in the sort of early 60s. So I was just wondering whether there were elements in your story that kind of connect together different types of capitals in different sorts of ways if that if that makes sense and whether whether that kind of influences the story that you that you end up telling yeah absolutely that's a great question and i mean i think the point that i'd really like to underline is that uh, there are so many different cities that i could have put together i mean the ones i chose are partly reflective of of my own sort of area of, of expertise but i mean cuba is the perfect example also i mean um also places like fort de france um and um port-au-prince um that changes the way we tell the story as well um and i think it's i, I think that's absolutely work that should be done um because i think those connections and thinking about the significance of those places in in the way that people are constructing their ideas about race and and anti-racist politics i think is really important so the like havana as you very rightly pointed out is is crucial um and you see you know lots of african african-american um activists going to conferences uh in havana um at particular moments there are other locations in in latin america and i think it's really important to to you know really think carefully about how these cities kind of like lift out of their their national frameworks and sort of speak to each other in ways that allow us to think about these things in different and new ways yeah, I think that's I think that's exactly right. And, you know, almost when you look on a, on a much less radical end of the spectrum, but in a much more sort of mainstream technocratic language, the kind of the founding towards the end of this period of um, UN habitats and that kind of effort to, to, to leverage what it is that cities for as, as kind of networked governance structures kind of really resonates in a, in a different in a different part of the of, of the equation. Um, we've got a lot of questions that are coming up now so I'm going to put some of those to you Sarah and, and I hope that will do justice uh, to them as I read through here. Um, we have a first question which um, pulls back to something you were saying at the start. It says, you mentioned how Paris was slash is uh, considered a capital of the West, and uh, this is an anonymous contribution. So correct me if I if I heard wrong. They say, but Dakar as a black capital. Could you further elaborate on what a black capital could be as a as a concept or in or in reality? They say. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question. And there's, um, I mean, I think you could also think about Paris as a black capital. Um, and I don't I don't want to suggest otherwise. I think. Um, what I did here in in situating these particular cities in particular moments in time, um, I guess perhaps sort of not, I mean, not necessarily inadvertently, but it thinks about Paris in terms of it being a capital of empire and a capital of European empire in this interwar period. Whereas when I'm looking at Dakar um, in this post imperial moment, it's uh, a lot of the actors and politicians involved in thinking about what this new Senegalese Republic is going to be and thinking about what Dakar is going to be in terms of black internationalism and black activism. They want to carve out a different space that's separate to what Paris was before. But you could equally look at Dakar in the interwar period and compare it to Paris. And in fact, it was um, referred to as um, La Vie Imperiale, so, so the imperial city, and also as um, La Petite Paris. Um, so the smaller Paris, because it it 
was considered in many ways similarly uh, cosmopolitan. A lot of the black activist organizations that I mentioned in relation to Harlem, so looking, for example, at Marcus Garvey's uh, organization, um, they were active in, um, in Dakar. Uh, the, only, the difference really is that in Paris, there was a lot more freedom to circulate newspapers and ideas and have meetings, whereas in um, Dakar, the structures of, of French uh, imperial surveillance were much more restrictive. And so there was much there's much less space to elaborate more radical <laughs> um, activism. Um, in terms of what I mean by a, a black city, what, I, what I've been trying to do, and I hope this comes out in the paper, is using the language of the activists who were in these cities or thinking about these cities. So when I think, when, when I'm calling um, Harlem, for example, like, uh, you know, a Mecca or, like a black metropolis, it's because that is the that's the language that um, the activists who are sitting there and who are there and who are working there and who are thinking about these cities as important spaces. That's how they're describing it, um, and because that's the meaning it has to them. Yeah, that's great. And actually, on that one, that that brings in um, a related question that we've had here, I think, from Matteo Caponi, who's who's who wants to raise the question about the role of religion. Um, in the construction of blackness, and, I, and I, this was actually one of the, the comments that I was going to raise with you as well. Did you? He asked here. Did you pay attention to the black churches and the mega churches in your in your cartography of transnational African and African American activism? I mean, and, and it's a super interesting question that because it speaks both to sort of the institutions, but also, of course, to the you know to the very specific religious networks and their their engagement in in some of these. I mean, you know, I'm thinking. From some of my own experience in, you know, in, in Geneva, for example, where you've got the Centre Forme de Jean Knox, where you have, you know, where you've had massive sort of cultural um, international collaborations and, and comings together over the years, really in the heart of that kind of institutional uh, internationalism. Um, mm -hmm. So I think uh, I think Matteo raises a really interesting point here about the role of, of, of transnationalism uh, or, or religious transnationalism in some of this. Yeah, absolutely. I think religion is really important. And again, it's something else I would have loved to talk about in the paper, but I think I was already running a little over time. Um, but yeah, absolutely. So um, in a couple of different ways. So you have black, black activists who operate within uh, existing religious networks um, around. So um, thinking here about sort of humanitarian aid, you have, um, so for example, a lot of African American activists go out to places like Addis Ababa in, in Ethiopia um, and are involved in a kind of developmental way through church networks and, and that's their transnational and international networks get built up that way. Um, conversely, you have, so one of the things that's really interesting about the way that race is conceived is obviously this intersects with all sorts of like cultural and political dynamics that are different in different places and religion plays into this. So if you, t if you take the example of the um, of French Empire um, and you think about Paris in the 1950s and 1960s, a lot of the students there are part of Catholic student groups and their activism is around thinking through what a decolonized Catholicism will look like. Um, because they can they can see that there's a lot to criticize in the church and, and in, in Catholic missionary um, work in places like the Congo. But for them, their faith has, has been incredibly important and that they, they can see that a black Catholicism can can create links internationally that can create a better world. Um, and this this starts to be this starts to intersect, too, with some of the uh, human rights movements in sort of the sort of post-war period in particular with the new, with Pope Pius's um, cyclicals about human rights and the way that that gets built into some of the discussions of the United Nations. Um, you see mass conversion of, well, I say mass, but you see literally hundreds of thousands of African Americans, for example, converting to Catholicism, whereas previously Catholicism had not been, it, it, African American communities had not been strongly Catholic prior to this point. But you see in the 1940s and 50s this the change in the position of the Catholic Church on issues around rights and a more, in certain cases, a more expansive approach. So, for example, in places like DC and New York, um, Catholic churches are much more inclusive of black communities than they had been previously, and that creates international linkages as well. Um, obviously, this, this connects too with uh, Islam um, and differences between the practice of Islam in places like Senegal as opposed to places like Algeria. 
and how those tensions about what it means to be Africa kind of play up against different versions of, of religious practice. I'm not sure that's answered your question, but in, in a nutshell, religion is incredibly important to all of this. Yeah, and, and it raises actually a, 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 the related point, which is about, you know, different sorts of languages and, and you mentioned their rights. And I mean, so perhaps then to, to sort of give due, due credence to the earlier sort of the historic, the early historical periods that you, that you cover in the talk and, and the emergence of that rights language um, you know, across the 1940s. Is there, are there ways in which that language itself gets taken up in different ways within different communities and also by different sorts of actors within those communities themselves. So, you know, is, is there, for example, a, a, a distinction in, in um, you know, gender usage of the, of the terminology or, or, or are there ways in which uh, a rights agenda is, you know, has both a normative function and, a, and can assist in mobilization of other causes, for sure, there's, a, there's an intersectionality there, but also in the ways in which uh, certain movements push back against the, you know, the, the, the assumed universality of a rights language and, the, and, and how that rubs up against reality. Um, and some of the other ways in which, of course, through, you know, much of the historiography on, on, on rights and, and human rights movements, uh, rights themselves can play a problematic role in some of the things that they claim to be the solution to. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, in the post-World War One period, self-determination and thinking about what self-determination means is, is, is a key concept. Um, and again, this is, this is where I think context makes such a big difference, um, you know, because it, it, this is, if you think about somewhere like Paris in the 1920s and 30s, there is a movement towards, you know, full citizenship within a French Republic that, that crosses across geographical groupings that later become different nation states in a, in a kind of post-World War II movement. So there's a kind of anti-colonial resistance that that coalesces around like a political right to self-determination, which they want to link to Republican belonging. That's quite different to the kind of conversations that you see around national independence and or federation. This is in the French context in the in the post-war period. Um, I think this question of where rights comes from is certainly something that's discussed across lots of different groups and they come to very different conclusions. Um, you know, are rights something that's granted by the state or they should be some, are they something that should be granted by sort of an international body? And to take, for example, uh, Du Bois's Pan-African Congress, on a domestic level, his proposal to do this was quite, was quite uh, contentious because there were a lot of people who believed that, you know, citizenship rights for African-Americans was a domestic issue that shouldn't be playing out on the international landscape. Whereas, you know, Du Bois kind of had a he thought the international landscape could give leverage to create these domestic rights, but he also, I would argue, especially later on, believed that, you know, there has to be some kind of guarantee of rights from an international level that makes states behave in a certain way. But then, of course, you run up against problems of national sovereignty. So, I mean, there, there are, yes, I think it's a, it's a very complicated issue in that people have different ideas about what rights mean, who should have access to rights, and of course, something like voting is incredibly key, um, particularly in an African-American context where, you know, um, women theoretically, white women theoretically gained the vote um, 1919, 1920. But that doesn't mean that, that um, African-American women gain it, whereas in the context of France, um, no women have the vote until 1944. Um, and then there are discussions about whether or not uh, women in African colonies should be allowed to have the vote or whether that, you know, that, that changes the, the balance of power between the metropole and the colonies. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really helpful way of thinking about it. Um, and it raises too, of course, you know, the, the, the distinction, not just between different rights regimes, but also between substantively different types of rights, you know, in a way that you're mm -hmm. saying between, between socioeconomic rights versus kind of more civic political uh, rights at the other end of the spectrum. And of course, there is a there's a macro level shaking out of the relative prioritization of those different languages of, of, of social transformation across this period that you're that you're writing about. Um, it then makes, you know, it, it brings into that sort of dynamic, as it were, between the individual versus the collective, between rights versus duties, for example, brings in another question and i suppose back to the the question we had earlier around religion as a different language of 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 of, of mobilizing some of these same same ideas another language that that takes us on to is is socialism um mm -hmm. and the way in which that fits into your story so i've got a, a question here 
um, from, uh, let me just find it. Um, um, it's from, sorry, it's from an, from an anonymous uh, contributor who's asking around the, in relation to the Black Panthers, but we might take it more broadly, actually, whether you found socialist, socialism uh, type ideals behind some of the discussions among Pan-Africanists, Pan-Africanists, sorry, on the use or idealized versions of place and space. So, so that's a question then really thinking about how the, the geographies of these movements uh, is shaped in relation also to prior languages of, for example, in this case, uh, socialism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really good question. And it's, it's really interesting because, of course, what constitutes socialism is very different depending on the context, right? Um, so, for example, socialism in the United States means something very different to socialism in, in France, where there's a, you know, a, at many periods throughout the, the 20th century, the Communist Party is actually sort of, you know, in, in elected positions in, in government. Um, so there's a distinction too, I think, to be made between like a kind of intellectual engagement with ideas of socialism or communism um, and a political engagement with places like Cuba and the Soviet Union. Um, so in the context of the Black Panthers in in Algeria, um, you know, the question of of the Soviet Union in is is a lively one and has been <laughs> for quite some time because the you know the, the Soviet Union is very interested in in Africa as a sphere of influence and the U.S. is very interested in Soviet Union not having Africa as a sphere of influence. So there's that dynamic, but there's also the dynamic of of you know um, not just Algeria but you know. African countries more broadly not wanting to be part of a kind of neo-colonial relationship with some a, a country like the Soviet Union. I mean, quite happy to take money <laughs> and but try to, trying to use it to their own political ends. And I think there's a I think many of the intellectuals and activists who end up in Algiers end up, you know, they, they take very seriously kind of Marxist um, uh, ways of thinking about the world, but they want to expand that as have many um, Black intellectuals, you know, prior to them, and and to really include like race in this economic language, and this has been like an ongoing tussle, I think, throughout the 20th century from the uh, from the Bolshevik Revolution onwards. Um, the failure, I think, of a lot of national communist groups, so in America, but also in France, but more broadly, I think, the Soviet Union, to engage really seriously with what it means to be part of a racialized other community um, is something that a lot of these activists spend a lot of time thinking about. So someone like Césaire is a Communist Party member um, until the, the 1950s with his famous letter where he resigns from the Communist Party because, but it, not because he's resigning from thinking about uh, these issues in a Marxist way, but because he does not think that the politics of, of communism as it plays out in the French uh, example engages with race properly. So I mean I think there's certainly, um, I think, sort of socialist thinking and socialist uh, and communist uh, thinking is, is certainly live and being discussed in really interesting ways. But it's also been, you know, enriched and expanded and taken much further uh, by these activists who are, you know, you know, reckoning with the lived experience of discrimination and an in, inheritance of, of, you know, centuries of this um, and a, a thinking in that way. Yeah, I think I think that's a you know it's a really helpful point that you make because you know and you and you 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 flagged up Césaire as well at the very start of your talk and 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 with with his with his writing there and it's interesting that he then becomes someone that looks to the the city and and or, or at least the city is a different scale of political action away from that in a sense overdetermined national territorial frame in which yeah a particular model of of, of communist political argument has has taken hold. And that was definitely, you know, I mean, from sort of my own experience as well, writing about kind of, uh, you know, the Cuban revolutionaries in the 60s and, in, and 70s and their efforts to escape those dominant languages, mm -hmm. which actually, again, led them on, you know, global tours through, you know, through through Algeria, through, through global urban centres that were away from that dominant framing on either the, 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 the Western side or also on the, on the communist side between, between the Soviet Union and, and China. Mm -hmm. um, and and you can literally almost map that out. 
I, I raised that because it, it points us to another question that, that's come in from uh, Jake Hodder, who's who, who's who's a geographer and and has also written, you know, along with colleagues, really interesting stuff around kind of conferencing the international, which touches on on some of your other work, Sarah, that you've done around the role of women in, in, in international thought from that period. And Jake asks here, I was really struck by the, or says here, I was really struck by the importance of events, e.g. E conferences, festivals, in your account, as key nodes in these black internationalist networks. Why do you think these types of ephemeral spaces, and I think that's the really interesting point here, uh, prove so productive in the development of black political intellectual thought? That's a really great question. And I should add that it's Jake's work that got me thinking about these ideas in the first place. So I really recommend that. Um, I mean, it, yeah, it's it's really interesting. Um, I think it's because they, they are these sites in which people from very different um, from very different political backgrounds come together to, to think about this question of race and in, in relation to questions of like national belonging, in relation to right, and they're not often necessarily people who would otherwise be in the same room. Um, and I think there's something very productive about that. Um, and I think, I mean, it's something else that I should that I should mention is that this talk is, you know, it, it's about intellectual elites um, in the sense that, that, you know, these are the people who have left behind, you know, meditations and reflections um, on their experiences that, you know, I've combined with thinking about how, you know, people are moving through city spaces. Um, so I think I think there are two things there. I think there are people who are in positions where they can dedicate time to thinking about these issues because they're thinking about the leadership of activist networks and and, and actively trying to build these things. Um, and so, so there's like a source base there that it means that I'm privileging these moments. Um, and I, I think that they they work. I, I think they're also manifestations of things that are harder for me to get at as a historian in terms of a methodological approach to archives, which is, you know, the the everyday interactions of, of people. Um, and, I, you know, I was trying to get at this a little bit with my references to the, the speakers corners um, and, and trying to think about like physical proximity of people like in Harlem, where everyone's sort of pushed up against each other. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think in part this is a, is a reflection of a, of a methodological approach, looking at these people who have been thinking about these things and who organise these events. Um, and, but, I, but I also think there is something there is something special about them because of the nature in which they bring together, you know, people from very different backgrounds who are thinking about, you know, race in, in different ways, partly because of their own lived experiences of being very different. I think there's something very generative about these moments where people realise that they're coming their experiences in some ways overlap, but in other ways don't with the people that they're talking to. Yeah, thanks. And, you know, I mean, I agree. I mean, Jake's done some very interesting work on here, but I think I think what, what you're saying there actually adds some some really important dimensions. I mean, it, and it, it also makes me think, and I'll, I'll just sort of point out there are some there are some more questions which we'll get to in a second. But while we're on the sort of this this moment, as it were, in the discussion around around geography and 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 uh, the, the role of sites and their temporality, often and the way they change over time. I mean, it does it 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 struck me this um, because I wanted to bring in more the gender dimension to to what you've been talking about, and because I thought you you made some really interesting examples in the paper and and in of course in in, in other parts of your work where you know it raises for me this question of whether we inhabit or we don't obviously inhabit spaces in the same ways i mean another job for steve legs carried out some interesting work on how you know in, in the micro spaces of the home you can look at the way gendered relations play out in such a way that that can interface with with political movements you know in terms of movement uh, meetings in back rooms and, and so forth and so once we sort of get to the micro level of domestic spaces and the experience of and here we Sort of raise questions of intersectionality of class and so forth. The experience of travelling domestic uh, assistance to those who who go to some of these conferences. And I thought you you used some really sort of telling uh, quotations in in the talk you gave us. Um, can I just ask you to think, sort of say a little bit more about about how those gender relations unfold within the spatial in these kind of in these kind of movements? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I mean, if we go back to the comments about the Nadal salon. Right, as a feminized space. I mean, I was really struck by that um, when I read it. And there's, there's more where, I mean, Césaire is quite critical 
about the Nadals and there's definitely a kind of intellectual distancing that he's you know trying to do there but he you know comments are made like oh you know we had to have tea they wouldn't let us drink alcohol um you know it was all very frilly there were you know there was lace on tablecloth and, and things like that and i found that really interesting that kind of discomfort with um the feminine so to speak um in you know in this landscape where they're trying to do important intellectual work i mean you know la revue de mon noir is not the most radical um you know black internationalist uh, periodical that is published certainly not but the work it does in creating networks you know it has a legacy uh, that, that that really does stretch into the post-war period um and i think it's i think it's really interesting the the way that because i of, what i what i often find when looking at these congresses for example these um these moments of mating is that women tend to be performing the jobs of organization and facilitate translation and publication um it, it's much rarer that they they talk themselves or give papers that are then published in transcripts in um in journals later and i think i think there are questions there about when it's appropriate for a woman to speak and how it's important for them to to sort of share their opinions and i think too about so um rene marin is a colonial uh, is a black colonial administrator who writes um this book called badawala that ends up he becomes the first in the in 19 i think it's 1921 he's the first black man to win the french prestigious literary prize the prix goncourt now the book itself begins with a preface that kind of condemns french colonial administration and it you know it's very controversial and that it's received amongst the african diaspora as being um you know this this moment of a of a french black man standing up to empire now maran didn't actually intend it in such a way he saw it as a critique of the colonial administrators failing to live up to the french republican ideals but what was interesting to me is that um jesse forsett who's an african-american um a languages teacher but also involved in also a writer and involved in organizing some of Du Bois's Pan-African Congresses was asked to translate it for English audiences because it was such a significant text for the African diaspora and she refused because she didn't think that she could continue to have a reputation as a respectable woman if she translated this this novel that was about um uh, the African tribal chief who has, I, who I believe has it's been a while since I've read it, who I believe has affairs. And she, Jessie Foss has been ridiculed for refusing to translate it. But I think actually it's getting at something there that's quite important, which is that, you know, black women and, you know, there's been a lot of work done on this idea of black women's respectability and how carefully they have to, if they have a public persona, have to tread this line of like middle class respectability if they're going to be taken seriously. And you can see this in the way that someone like Josephine Baker, who was a, a dancer, a very successful dancer in, in 1920s Paris, who had her banana leaf skirts and, you know, then tried to turn to activism in the sort of 1950s and, and 60s and was absolutely rejected by African American civil rights groups because they didn't take her seriously and they made quite sort of lewd jokes about her um despite the fact i mean you know she was a bit eccentric but the point that i'm trying to make here is that the respectability of black women in these black international networks was often key to the amount of access they had to sharing their ideas and opinions so for, so for the historian then i mean what sort of challenges does that pose and i guess this speaks also to the work you've done on on the history of women in, in international thought for sort of you know for, for being able to find the material to to write that back i think we i mean if you think about this from the perspective of of what we think about as a source of thought right of how we trace intellectual genealogies i think you have to be quite um creative sometimes in thinking about where you can find sources of women's thought and often you can find incredible sort of political critiques and commentaries in letters in correspondence i mean none of this is new to um practitioners of african-american or african sort of intellectual histories they're used to looking in um what might be considered unconventional places aka not a published book or not a published article um 
but I think we need, we, we really need to sort of follow in in their you know incredible footsteps and in in sort of be inspired by their creativity in terms of looking in different places um, for sources of, of of women's thought and thinking through you know the roles and, and sort of really taking seriously what it means to be a translator for example so a lot of these conferences are at least bilingual but they're not so this this requires some translation someone has to you know either translate the papers or translate on the spot the kind of conversations that are going on and often i think that's that's lost in how we think about these congresses and it's often women who are who are doing these roles which are quite you know important yeah absolutely um and and your 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 point is well taken as well i mean around around thinking creatively but also by thinking outside of the normal vehicles through which we reach into the past one one also comes back more critically to the 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 assumed and the presumed uh, knowledges that we've that we've inherited from the you know from the the formal archive the written word and so forth and the official documents that we that we've built up the existing knowledge base from um that kind of very loosely touches on a on a on a further question i have here from uh, from our audience um, from Girek Peron and he's asked how do you see the evolution of black authors vision of Paris and say so here I'm thinking that one way you would see this would be through you know the recourse to you know um, more creative uh, kind of archival and, and, uh, and historical investigation from the 1920s through the 1960s uh, in relation to other cities as well like Dakar and Algier so for example from the capital of those without country uh, to the capital of an empire that's on the verge of decolonizing. So I think I'm guessing here this is a question really about where these urban sites fit in within the larger uh, transnational uh, or, or international developments that are taking place at the time. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question and I think again the answer has to be that it, it depends which black authors. Um, so for example African Americans um, see or write about Paris and and France more broadly as a as a colorblind uh, republic because the kind of experiences that they have in Paris are very different to the kind of experiences they have in Jim Crow America um, and they also see um, men like African men um, being part of the National Assembly from you know from a, from the so for example someone like Blaise Diagne in 1919 and they they use they use these examples of of, of um, black success to try and uh, propel domestic change so Paris becomes and, and France becomes this reference point for well look how well they're doing republicanism um, you know I, I mean I'm being reductive here but it, it becomes a reference point for a lot of African Americans and it's also um, it feeds into, you know, conceptions more broadly in America of of Paris as the city of light, the city of culture, the the um, the source of the Enlightenment that you know then was carried to America to create this independent state free of Britain. Um, so those kind of attitudes, but that it's it's quite different then to um, to black writers who are from the French Empire who come to Paris to study. Um, because they have quite a different experience um, and there, there, there's a lot of talk sometimes about the way that African Americans are often treated better than than black Africans um, and there's a lot of conversation about you know the way that sort of so for example um, the French Caribbean um, black men from the French Caribbean um, have a different citizenship status to many in um, in, in French Africa and so race is not Blackness is not the um, the point of uh, commonality that African Americans might think it is when they come to Paris, for example. Um, so essentially, what I'm trying to say is that, that there are very different positionalities that feed into how Paris is imagined. Because for a lot of people within the French Empire, Paris is the is the seat of the empire, and it's the place where you know they can go to study and perhaps be assimilated into a sort of republican citizenship that, in many ways, they're not they're not. Uh, part of um, currently. I mean, I think the interesting thing about Paris becomes an opportunity for men like Leopold Sédar Senghor or Aimé Césaire um, or Léon Gonsrandemas, people who study in Paris and then 
um, you know, have a, have a degree of education, have a degree of, of political freedom. Um, Paris is a place where you can agitate for equal uh, rights within the Republic. And they imagine themselves as, as, as French. And there's a lot of literature done on this relationship between race and political belonging and cultural assimilation. Um, but for them, Paris is like the seat of the empire in the same way that for, for a lot of people, as I mentioned in my talk, for you know, West Indian travelers coming to London to, or students coming to London to study, you know, it's the seat of empire, but then it becomes a place in which they realize that they're not considered British by other people. So it, it becomes a, a space of alienation. And I, I think that's true of, of Paris as well. It becomes a profoundly alienating place. Um, so I think the, those positionalities are really important and those all exist throughout the time period that you mentioned. But I think also there's a there's a generational shift, um, you know, from those who are active in the interwar and sort of 1940s, 1950s, and then those in the post-imperial kind of moment into the next generation, a younger generation who will often be coming to Paris to study, but they're far more critical and they're much more interested in sort of national independence and thinking about the experiences of education that they can bring back to their country. So it's a very fraught relationship, I think. Yeah, and a, and, and, and a really and a productive one as well, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I think what you're saying there about these sort of nuanced tensions between race and blackness and the languages that become available in those ways. I mean, it, it's interesting to set alongside the overlapping languages of, you know, I was just sort of, you know, writing down here, you know, black internationalism, pan-Africanism, anti-colonial nationalism, you're talking about that sort of later period, um, you know, revolutionary anti-colonialism, you know, and, and, and thinking here where someone like Ireland or, or, or a figure like Roger Casement fits and some of the arguments that are being made from that Irish context, uh, speaking back to the British mainstream metropolitan language, which is, of course, also a legal system, which is, of course, also a whole series of of assumed and, you know, racialized assumptions, but not in the language of blackness per se, or at least not overtly or not always. And it's, it's quite interesting to think, and, and you always, so I think your work is really interesting because it allows us to do this, how some of those languages both overlap, uh, rub up against one another, provide sort of moments of productive engagement across territories, and that's where the transnational part comes in. Um, and, 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 you know, really kind of uh, throws a whole series of different windows onto this sort of, you know, sort of mainstream history we have of, of, of the period. Thank you. I mean, yeah, that, I mean, that is, that is the, the hope. I mean, I think there's, there's so much going on here um, and, and so many different actors. And I think, um, I mean, I, I think this idea about the languages and the, the stakes that are being claimed. So, I mean, I mentioned in the in the article, someone like Claude Mackay is really interested in the Irish example, right? And is very pro, um, you know, Irish anti-colonialism. And that's true of a lot of different um, figures throughout a kind of pan-African diaspora. So someone like um, Chik Anta Diop, uh, who is a Senegalese historian and, and activist, um, starts to, you know, look at Ireland as the model for how you might think about a kind of intellectual decolonization. And so starts talking about the way that, um, you know, indigenous languages in Africa that have been lost under colonialism should be like Gaelic in Ireland retaught to the next generation, even if these um, activists who are leading the charge for independence, they themselves can't necessarily speak it fluently. There's an effort should be made to make the next generation do so. So I mean, Ireland, yeah, I mean, the, the question of language in many different ways becomes really important. I've got, um, I mean, we, we, we're nearing the end of our, of our time, um, but I, I'm, I, I can squeeze in just a couple more questions. I'm, I've been saving one and apologies to the person who submitted it around, around some contemporary resonances until the end. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, there's a there's an additional question here around um, the military, actually, or, or at least African American soldiers in France, specifically in World War One. Um, they were respected in France, but then when they went back to America, they were rejected, um, and some of them even killed in the South. Uh, the the author of the question says, "What was what was their impact on Pan Africanism?" So I'm guessing here, what's the particular interest of this transnational group in that sense? Yeah, I mean, this is. It's a really great question because it is really, really important. So, I mean, for many African Americans, fighting in World War One is their first experience in France, um, and they it, it's incredibly formative um, because they see themselves as being treated very differently to because they're in segregated unions, 
but in France, that's not the case to the point where um, there's a, the Americans have to force the French to circulate a memorandum telling their officers not to treat um, people of colour in the same way as they treat white people because it's not going to fly. Um, and of course, this, this causes controversy, but it also, it, it's an interesting entry point into um, how the French deal with racism because on in uh, several military bases in Saint Nazaire and a couple of other places, the names of which are escaping me at the moment, following World War One, they have uh, they have problems where French troops are you know beating up um, African troops and or Senegalese troops in particular, and they they talk about this as the American virus, right? Which really impresses obviously African American troops because they're like, well, you know, they're seeing this as a problem that Americans have and they're hitting it on the head. Um, I mean, obviously, France is not without its racism, but it is it is incredibly important, this experience. But also one of the I mean, to bring the gender dynamic back into it as well. One of the things that stuns African-American troops is that they're permitted to visit um, brothels with white women. Because this would not be the case. And there's there's prolonged conversation about this to the point where in um, black newspapers into the 1920s, you see people like James Weldon Johnson, who's a prominent um, black activist leader and people like W.B. Du Bois talking about this as the ultimate litmus test of how the French are colorblind because they allowed African-American troops to visit white women in, in brothels. Now, leaving aside sort of, I mean, it, this brings up interesting questions about class as well, um, because whilst uh, many white French women did, of course, marry um, uh, both um, African-American but also um, other sort of people of, of color, it, it wasn't as straightforward as that, and it, it created very complicated dynamics. And this is something that Paulette and Jane Nadal talk about as well. They talk about the fact that Antillian men um, are allowed, you know, they think about themselves as being assimilated because they can marry white women. But Paulette and Jane Nadal talk about the fact that they can only marry working class white women. So there's, a, there's an obvious like class dynamic to this as well. Um, but, you know, this again, sorry to feed it back to the, the question of the military, I think this is incredibly formative for African-American thinking about France and um, Paris in particular. Um, and this is partly, I think, because there's a there's a misunderstanding about what constitutes race in these different contexts. Well, not so much a misunderstanding as in there's different um, races constituted differently in different contexts. So being American and black is quite and, and being in France is quite different to being, you know, say, for example, from Senegal and being in France. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really interesting. And, and you know, you, you probably know best, much better than me, but I, you know, I wonder whether this sort of the history of, of militarism is, is underwritten in these kind of in these kind of contexts. I mean, I haven't read Margaret Macmillan's new book yet, but I, you know, I wonder whether there'll be some pointers to it in there. But but you know the just the extent in terms of scale, in terms of numbers, but also in, in terms of as you, as you say, kind of cross class experiences and, and the force breaking down of some categories, and then the effort to kind of restrain and, and maintain some of those in those foreign territories. With you know, as you said, with the with the, the American directive there, I think that was fascinating. Um, it brings us on then to to a question which I've kind of been saving towards the end, just because I think it kind of wraps up. Uh, nicely uh, a lot of the you know the, the wide range of, of topics that you've been thrown <laughs> thrown at you in in light of your your talk Sarah and it's, I think you've given us some really interesting answers to um, and there's a question about the contemporary resonances of some of this and I'm just scrolling here trying to find it so while I while I keep talking but um, um, the 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 question says um, now that maybe you can help me find it. here it is uh, can you situate these connections in 2020? Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> good luck, but I'll let you, I'll, I'll talk for another second or so, you can think about that. Um, and I'm thinking here of the BLM movements in, in New York and Paris as an obvious example. And, you know, I don't, and 2020, yes, but also probably, you know, we could, in the last decade or so, of course, and some of those transnational connections. What connections uh, are there then with technology and how does that change some of these, some of these, uh, frameworks that we've been we've been mentioning and, and developments and are the social media and podcast communities almost new nodes of global cities so that's you know it's a really interesting angle there new ways of of forming that that proximity that you mentioned about with specific respect to Harlem but of course I mean all the cities are really that their economies of scale in a sense for, for, mm -hmm. for better and for worse um, 
so yeah, how how does some of this play out in in light of you know the, in light of the year we've had, um, leaving COVID to one side, but but focusing more on the, on of course on BLM and and, and related movements. I mean, that's a really great question. I'm not sure I can do it justice, but I'll try. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the the Black Lives Matter movements are, you know, they're extraordinary and their international reach is is absolutely amazing. Um, and it makes me think of, for example, in 1963, um, Martin Luther King's March on Washington. And there were, you know, this is the, this is the one that he gave his famous I have a dream speech at. And you know that that particular that particular protest that particular march you know it had there were support marches in Paris in Cairo in London across the world, um, and the world was watching the civil rights movement. They were watching what happened in Alabama. They were watching what happened in Selma. They were watching, and and had been for for some time, and I think what always surprises me um, when I look through newspaper articles, when I look through personal correspondence, is the extent to which the world has been interlinked and connected in very deep ways for a very long time. That I, you know, which for, for us, when we have these connections like the internet, for example, and social media, and there's a kind of instantaneity to our interactions, I'm amazed at how much these international reactions and solidarities and impulses have a historical lineage that go back that goes back quite far. I mean, that's not in any way to subsume the significance or importance or uniqueness of the Black Lives Matters uh, movement, um, but I think it really is. It really it, it, it's a really fascinating moment. I think it's it really speaks to. I mean, I wonder how much the story that I told today is a 20th century story and how much that changes in a 21st century where our understanding of space is so determined by the links we can make um, internationally in a moment. So, you know, my my sense of 2020 in lockdown whilst the Black Lives Matter movement is of an urban space that is is dominated by, you know, the the riots in Philadelphia, by the protests in London. So the the kind of iconography and imagery, just from a personal perspective, of the Black Lives Matter movement, the spaces that I situate them in are the spaces that I've seen these extraordinary photographs of. That you know they're deeply rooted in these particular spaces and intentions and politics of very particular spaces, but which have an international resonance. So I wonder. I mean, I don't have an answer for this, but I think it is really important to think about how you know it things are similar in that there's a continuity in terms of international solidarity against racism and international sort of pan-Africanisms and black internationalisms but also how much things have changed and how much our imagined or symbolic geographies or senses of place have you know uh, are overlaid now in, in different ways because of our access to different, you know, to news coverage of, of these different process, uh, protests simultaneously. Yeah, I mean, I think that that point about sort of the language of place is, is, is a great place to end because, I mean, you know, the prior question and, and your answer to it now, Sarah, is, 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 you know, is right to point to that, that tension as it were between the 20th century dynamics and the 21st century realities we're in which of course is not simply mediated by technology technology accentuates other developments and so forth but there it's an open question i think as to the extent to which the one story is a preface to the other or or, or something else and whether there are or aren't connections between them clearly there are in many many ways but um it's 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 also think interesting i think to think of some of the languages and possibilities that have lost along the way um, as well as those that are gained. Um, Sarah, I mean, I've I've learned a huge amount from hearing you talk uh, this afternoon. It's it's a fascinating paper, and I look forward to to reading it when it when it comes out. It's a it, it comes from a much larger and interesting oeuvre of work, which is really, I think, taking history, international studies, and other disciplines in 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 interesting and new directions. And so, I really would recommend to anybody who's who's tuned in to pick up Sarah's book when it comes out in the new year and just to remind you the title of that it's race rights and reform black activism across the French Empire in the US from World War One to the Cold War 
Um, it'll be fascinating to follow your work, Sarah, as this kind of more of this emerges in, in print in the future. So it just remains for me to say thank you ever so much for your time uh, and for your contributions, to thank also our audience who provided some really fascinating questions and apologies if I didn't quite get a chance to get to all of them. Um, but it's been great to have you put in questions direct to Sarah and to sort of spur the spur the discussion on. And my thanks to Nena, who's managed this whole event from uh, comms to managing today's discussion on a new platform for us, which I think has hopefully uh, gone relatively smoothly. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Sarah, for your contributions. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all at a future event. So from me, farewell. Thank you, and thank, thank you, Simon and uh, Nana, um, for setting this up, and thank you to the audience for your wonderful questions.